Hello, hello, happy, happy, happy Friday, everybody. Hopefully, you guys can hear me. It's look good in my screen, even though initially we have some difficulties connecting uh, with Ian, but everything now seems to be very no be normal. Let me know if you guys can see and hear me, okay? Just type uh, below at the comment. And thank you very much for joining me and Loco here again today on Loco Borak Kita. Ha, pejam cilik, pejam cilik. This is our seventh season already. I mean, seven, uh, yeah, seven seasons already. Uh, okay, how's your day so far? I believe everyone dah dengar announcement from our PM. Uh, and uh, I think this, is, this extended MCO is very crucial for Malaysia. So we don't want to repeat the same process again. So stay calm, stay in. And watch local, okay? Okay. Um, as you guys know, today local gonna chit chat with a renowned documentary photographer and a contributor of National Geographic. Let us. Hi, Ian. Hello. Hello, Ian. Hello, hello. Nice hello, to hi. You. Good to e meet you. And how are you today? I'm good. I'm very good. Thank you very much. Okay. Let me. Um, okay. All right. Oh, hold on, hold on. Uh, are you there? Hello. Yeah, that's a bit oh, yeah, of an okay. Accident. Sorry, something wrong with my earpiece. Okay. How was this CMO been for you so far? I've been uh, surprised. I thought I'd go crazy. <laughs> I thought I was but but so far it's been nice. I I you know I've got my wife is good company, so it's always uh, you know we we manage to eat quite well and <laughs> we have a quite a good view from 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 our apartment. Good, so good, good. We are lucky. Um, we just moved here like six months ago, and uh -huh. uh, our last place was uh, in the center of KL, mm -hmm. uh, and. All around there is um, skyscrapers, and I think at that time when I was staying there, I was going a bit crazy. So I'm happy to do the MCO here. <laughs> uh, okay, so you have the full view of Kuala Lumpur, I believe. No, 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 just no. just the quiet side of the neighborhood. Ah, okay, all right. Yeah, the other side, um, our condo. Uh -huh. uh, on the other side, you have a residential area with lots of trees. On I the see. other side, you have the highway, and uh, uh, we on the quiet side. So okay. Good and it's even it's even quieter right now, right? <laughs> oh yeah, it's, yeah. I can hear the birds every morning. It's well, that's good. Oh, good. That's good. Okay, let's begin with our first part of today's sessions. I we're gonna talk about your uh, photography background. Okay. All right. And my first question is, what got you interested in photography? Um, I when I was young, I was always my father lent me uh, his camera. Sorry, I'm a bit confused. I keep hearing like I'll can you say something about our hello Riz. Hello. So should I start? Yeah, you start please, yes. Okay, so I my my dad get uh lent me his camera when I was about sixteen years old. And uh I he taught me how to use the camera and mm -hmm. from the pictures I took during our holidays. I suddenly realized um, on some of my pictures mm -hmm. that it never looked exactly the way I saw it. That the camera somehow, if I did it, if I didn't get the exposure right, mm -hmm. would create something more interesting. Okay. So that got my interest, and I became more and more interested with photography that way. How long is, has it been? Have I been doing photography? Yeah, I've been doing photography, I think, from the start. Uh, I think professionally, 20 years. Wow. And Meaning, when did you start doing it full time? I mean, full time. Uh, I would say I started in my mid to late 20s. All right. And then, uh, so yeah, 20 years from there. And I think when I was seriously considering it as a career, uh, it was just after I finished college. Mm -hmm. And I decided to travel with a camera, take pictures. I was traveling for like six months each year wow. to use that time to learn how to take pictures, mm -hmm. to 
build a portfolio. And right. I did that for pretty much three, three years. Um, so half a year, then when I came back, I would be broke. So I had to go and work, save up <laughs> and I'll do it again. Yeah. All right. What was your most difficult shot? My most difficult shot? Yeah. Um, I never really think of it in that way. Not as okay. a shot, but I would say maybe a difficult project or challenging project. Okay. Um, one of my most challenging projects was when I was starting to work on the coal industry in China because I was very much interested in how um, coal mining and the coal industry was impacting, you know, the, the environment. Mm -hmm. uh, that was back in 2007, 2008. Right. Uh, so I would go into coal mines, I would go into uh, industrial plants uh, and photograph workers in these places. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, yeah, that was pretty challenging for me. I see. So before I ask the fourth question, for those who are watching us today, uh, on Ajak Borak, local Ajak Borak, you guys can, if you guys have questions for Ian, please do so by typing your questions on the comments below, yeah? All right, uh, my next question will be, what is your favorite uh, photo of all time? You've been doing it for, for 20 years, so what is your most favorite photos? I don't have a favorite again, I have lots of favorites. Okay, let's uh, talk about your favorite photos. <laughs> um... I think, well, some from that, that time when I was working in the coal industry because it was so difficult to get inside those places to photograph it. Yeah. Uh, and when you look at, when you go inside a, an, a steel plant or a, a heavy, heavy uh, industrial plant, mm -hmm. it's very impressive. You feel like you are in another world. Okay. Uh, so I remember when I first got into these places, there was smoke and steam rising out from the ground. Uh, from, from factories, mm -hmm. uh, you see workers carrying really heavy things, um, and their life was like a, like a dark dream. Right. So you know, I think some of my favorite pictures come from around that time, right. but also uh, my later work um, started focusing more on landscapes. Uh, and I would look at, uh, and I would shoot with a panoramic camera. Okay. And often, one of the reasons why I started doing this type of landscape photography, mm -hmm. uh, because it uses a large camera, and so the quality of the, uh, the resolution and detail from the pictures is very high, yep. is because I was interested in how man was making marks All right. the Earth's surface, mm -hmm. the impact on the environment through yeah. industry, uh, development, etc. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I would use these camera, this type of camera on a tripod and climb to very high positions to look for landscapes that have been um, scarred by, by, by uh, pollution. I see. It's quite a tough job for you as well. Uh, it's exciting and exciting. sometimes it's tough, yeah. yeah. So how do you take care of your safety during this kind of, you know, like job? Because I think, I believe this is not also, uh, it's, it's exciting, but at the same time, you have to also take care of your safety and those, you know? I mean, I, I would say that when I grew up learning photography, I, I was very much self-taught. So quite often it's been common sense for me to, to try and take care of myself in these situations. But sometimes I think there's a certain amount of naivety, you know, like a uh, kind of innocence. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean that, you know, you have to, you have to pay attention to your surroundings. Uh, I don't, you know, I'm, there are other photographers who maybe do conflict situations, etc., where you have to get special training All to right. work in uh, that kind of uh, situation. But most of the places I go to, um, it can be potentially dangerous, but mm -hmm. you have to um, uh, use your common sense and be careful. Yeah. So maybe we can talk about a little bit about your your gear. What kind of gear do you do you have, and how many of them? <laughs> um, I don't think I, I have um, a couple of um, Canon DSLRs. Mm -hmm. uh, they're 
um, uh, the Canon 5D Mark IV and III. Right. Uh, I have um, I have a Fuji uh, film camera right. that that uses uh, that uses a very large type of uh, medium format film. Okay. Um, and that's I have a drone. That's about it. Okay, that's pretty easy. Um, this is very interesting questions um, by one of our fellow um, uh, viewers. When you shoot your fellowship like the Abigail Cohen Grant Fellowship in Documentary Photography, how did you find the issue that uh, you want to address? Uh, I was already working on that project. So um, I had decided I was, work uh, I was interested in doing a story on the Yellow River in mm -hmm. China. It was China's... Uh, China has two very important rivers, and and that was the second longest one in China, and it it, it feeds most of North China, uh, providing water for industry, for um, agriculture, and right. also for for cities. Um, and it has there were many reports that since the late nineties that the river was basically dying. Uh, many many parts of it more than 50% of it was uh, severely polluted. Mm -hmm. um, and to the point where it was unfit for uh, human use at all, you know. Uh, and by the time I started thinking of working on that, um, I wanted to document the whole river, but it's something like, uh, I think it's about 4,000 kilometers long. Oh. So I can't, I can't do it off just through using my own savings. Uh, I had to apply for grants, and so uh, through a series of grants apply that I applied for, uh, mm -hmm. I was brought to help me produce this work. I see. Tell me, tell us more about this um, uh, documentary. About the project? Yeah, about the project. So um, the river uh, is important to China uh, because it's kind of. Like culturally, it's known as the as the birthplace of China's five thousand year old civilization. So, mm -hmm. culturally, is important. Um, but uh, as a resource as well for water, yeah. uh, it supplies water to almost uh, fifty percent of the industry in agriculture uh, mm -hmm. and the population in the northern part of China. Oh, so, yeah. but. At the same time, it's a very dry part of China. The river doesn't actually hold that much water. Most of the right. water that China gets um, stays in the south. Mm -hmm. So only 14% of the water stays in the north. And as a result, when you travel in that region, there are a lot of deserts. It looks very dry uh, right. and dusty as well. Mm -hmm. So. But at the same time, if that river dies, it would be an environmental, have a, a huge environmental consequence because, yeah. you know, China needs to be able to support itself through that river and through, mm -hmm. through these regions. So that was one of the main reasons why I decided to work on that because I felt when you look at these landscapes, uh, they, are, they have their own kind of beauty. Yeah. Um, at the same time, uh, they tell so many stories if you know what what goes on there or if you are able to unpack it. Mm -hmm. But the thing that I find striking is that landscapes, you, you tend to look at landscapes as if they're there forever. They don't move, they don't change. Yeah. But when you actually look at the surface of these landscapes, you see uh, you're able to tell that maybe um, that there has been some kind of impact because of government policy, environmental policy, development, or industry that goes, goes on there. And the result, what you're looking at, the fact that it's really dry or there's a desert form there, etc., mm -hmm. it's because of this history that has passed, that has happened over the years. Yeah. So my purpose of traveling along the river was to try and document um, the landscape to show its beauty, but also to show the kind of uh, impact that has happened over the years. Yeah. 
Did you feel the government um, took necessary steps to address the issue you highlighted in this uh, in the Abigail Cohen uh, Fellowship? The government has been trying to address this issue before I even started working on this story. I because see, I in, see. in the late 90s, um, uh, the river stopped flowing and oh. for seven months it didn't reach the sea. Mm -hmm. And so that caused a national panic. Uh, and so the government tried to create a, um, a nature reserve in at the source of the river, which is oh. high up on the Qinghai Plateau near the Himalayas. Uh, and that area has a lot of permafrost, it has glaciers, uh, it has a lot of lakes. Uh, and many of those areas were drying up. Uh -huh. um, and the grasslands were dying as well, so because of overgrazing. Mm -hmm. So by creating this, this nature reserve, they wanted to protect that area because that is the source of the Yellow River's water. Yeah. The problem is the, the issues relating to environment uh, uh, degradation is very complex. Yeah. So many of the policies that they implemented, some scientists feel that it wasn't uh, it wasn't really solving the problem. Mm -hmm. Because when you look at reports many, many years later, they say that actually the government says on the one hand that uh, it's managed to resolve many of the problems, but some scientists believe that uh, the reason why the lakes now are fuller with water and why the rivers are flowing better is mm -hmm. because of climate change as the temperatures rise mm -hmm. uh, through the, the, the permafrost melts the yeah. glaciers melt and that feeds into the lakes and into the rivers, uh, giving an art artificial uh, perception that there's a lot of water uh, in the river and that's, and that's because of the, the results wow. of the policy. Very, very interesting project you have there. Okay, um, another question. How open are the countries? This is, this is some, nothing to do with the uh, previous questions. How open are the countries you visit to allowed to taking shots that may be controversial controversial uh i mean i'm able to travel and i am able to take pictures so no one stops me from doing that uh and i'm not out to challenge uh i've never really had problems in that that respect sometimes okay. mm -hmm. Uh, in some issues, uh, it might be more delicate. I have to ask permission to get inside certain right. places. But generally, it's not really an issue that uh, I've had to deal uh, with that often. As long as you adhere to uh, to the country's rules and regulation, we'll be fine, right? Okay, another question is about uh, maybe can you give us tips for traveling with camera gear? Do you travel with heavy gear or this is maybe for your um, leisure traveling? Okay. Not so much on the work. I, I believe when you do for working, traveling and uh, working uh, trip, you might have lo lots of um, gears, but for, for your leisure traveling, so do you travel with heavy? I think, I think bring what you want for what you plan to do. So like if my, if I travel and I'm even if I'm doing a project, um, yeah. I like to stay light as light as possible. So often I'm only uh, in the old days when I was working with uh, film cameras, um, some of the cameras were often smaller. Yeah. So um, I would bring maybe two Leica bodies, um, and they are quite small cameras. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, if I had to travel for work. Um, I might travel with just uh, one uh, 5D Mark IV, a couple of prime lenses, uh, and that's how I like to work most of the time. And I, maybe I might have a backup body in my suitcase. Um, if I'm on holiday, I just have my phone. <laughs> All right. Uh, maybe we can proceed to the next questions. Uh, what would you advise budding photographers out there who do want to follow your footsteps? Um, don't think so much about your equipment. Oh, yeah. Think more about taking pictures mm -hmm. and spend more time looking at the world around you and, and finding interesting things to photograph. Yeah. Uh, and photographers don't just take 
pretty pictures, they, they make stories with their pictures. So sometimes those pictures might not be just one beautiful picture, but it might be a series of beautiful pictures on one subject. So if you think along those, if you think of it along those lines and you imagine yourself writing a story with pictures, mm -hmm. uh, you could do great work with just a mobile phone right. uh, if you wanted to. Have you ever um, collaborated with any tourism uh, bodies or um, to promote uh, tourism? No, no. I mean, I, well, I did, I did, uh, I did a series of works um, that was part of an artist residency, uh, and it was supported by the um, Selangor Tourist. Oh, I can show you the book. All right, sure. So this book, uh, this is the special edition version. So it's white. The standard edition is sold out. It's black. Mm -hmm. uh, but but this was supported by the um, um, the, the Selangor tourism. Selangor tourism is never had, right? But uh, so what so do you have in that book? So it's I travel along the coastline of um, of uh, Selangor. Selangor. All yeah. right. Uh, and I was looking at the Malacca Straits. Okay. Uh, the introduction is written by uh, Tash Orr and Kukai Kim. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can see, I don't know if you can see, but this is like, I was traveling, looking at aerial shots of right. the line. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Uh, Interesting. All that's right. That's please. Okay. Uh, um, uh. Very interesting landscape. Yeah, so I was, so a lot of this in the first chapter was shot. Uh, I'll show aerial you aerial shot. Easier, yeah. So not all of the book is aerial shots, but okay. uh, I felt like as an introduction, mm -hmm. uh, there were aerials, and then afterwards uh, you have other images here uh, in different parts of Selangor. Okay. So, so this is um, coffee book table for tourism Selangor to promote Selangor, I believe. Um, so Why it was, it, it wasn't as, I suppose in a way, indirectly, it was a yeah, way of indirectly. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, but the, the whole idea was, uh, it was an artist residency that was to help. I mean, it was it only sadly it only happened for one year where they had this artist residency, but, mm -hmm. um, in that year they, they had a workshop for photography, mm -hmm. uh, and also, um, they invited an artist, and in that case, it was me to uh, do a document of of Selangor. And the idea of it was that every year we would invite yeah. some kind of uh, well-known uh, photographer mm -hmm. to document parts of Malaysia. Because if you think about our history in Malaysia, yeah. uh, we don't have much documentation. Uh, most of our most of our his history or or documentation comes from from the from the British mm -hmm. uh, because they're the ones who it was within that culturally they were really interested in in documenting and in photography etc but uh, for us we're not as uh, uh, we haven't done as much of that so the idea of doing that every year mm -hmm. was was kind of interesting and would have right. been a great thing to to have for yeah. Malaysia yeah, we have portrait, we have people to photograph, we have our architecture to photograph. I think, you know, Malaysian has a lot of uh, potentials uh, in terms of, you know, using uh, every angle to promote our tourism. Uh, and I think... Uh, I, I think it's, I'm not thinking of it along the lines of tourism, but I'm thinking yeah. along the, the lines of actually understanding a culture, a snapshot of a culture at this one time. Uh, yeah, tourism yeah. implies commercialism on, on one level and that you need that for an economy and that's mm -hmm. that's important but i think more important is actually building up a documentation of um our cultural roots if you look back into the past mm -hmm. you have you have voices of the british who talk about what happened there and it's not the voice of malaysians let's say um and you need a multitude of voices like lots of different voices of people who document what's going on yeah. in Malaysia, so that you know you know, so that that we don't always just talk about how nice our food is. Yeah. How, that we don't we don't deal with just the superficial aspects of it. Right. We're thinking about more, more deeper issues. 
yeah. that help us understand our culture. True, I agree with you. Yeah, maybe maybe we, you and us, local, maybe can suggest this to our ministry. You know, to take up this project and to do is you know, even well, bigger. Patrick, that would yeah. be very nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's because it's a very interesting project. You know, because um, not many people look at this on um, in this angle. You know, everybody likes to promote promote tourism, but sometimes it's you know lack of um, uh, the deep um, uh, aesthetic of you know the photographer eye and you know your belief in photography. You know, this is very important as well. Um, if you could advise, I think this is very interesting questions that I prepared by my team. If you could advise uh, the Ministry of Tourism, Art and Culture, Malaysia about using photography to promote Malaysia. What would you advise? Uh, I think it's nice that you have the light-hearted stuff like Malaysia is truly Asia and all of those kind of things. Yep. But I think um, a real investment in culture and the arts mm -hmm. where, where instead of focusing on just people come, people come to Malaysia not just for the beaches, uh, but also some for culture. If we go to, if you think about all the countries that that Malaysians or people like to travel to, it's always a combination of entertainment, but also culture. You, when you travel to Europe, you're also interested in the architecture. You're interested in the arts that goes on inside yeah. there, the museums that they have to offer. But you can't fill up museums if you don't have artists working, doing good work and meaningful work to fill up the museums, for example. So on the grassroots, if, you, if there's policies that support artists, photographers, and people to actually document and also contribute towards the cultural um, richness or wealth of the country, then there'll be more reasons for people to come to this, to, to Malaysia. Quite often yeah. when people come to, an example would be like, a lot of people come to KL but they don't know what KL has to offer because mainly what we see are skyscrapers. And then if anyone's traveling around Malaysia, they would go to other places, smaller towns, maybe like sure. Bang or some parts Malacca. of the East. Yeah, yeah, Malacca, you know, where there's some kind of culture and history or yeah. you can actually see real life that locals live, you mm -hmm. know. Um, but when you arrive in KL and you're in the center of the CBD area, yes, you need the CBD area, but it also looks like just about any other city, every other city. Yeah. So you lose what's special about it. So mm -hmm. instead of getting rid of, it's important to have the tall buildings and, and these impressive things, but it's also important to keep all the local stuff and, and because that's part of our culture as well. Yeah, maybe KL has to do more experience uh, tourism. Yeah, to keep KL alive also, you know, because not everybody have the opportunity to go or to travel to the rest of the Malaysian states. You yeah. know, sometimes they just um, transit in Kuala Lumpur, but we still trying to, you know, um, um, uh, promote promoting uh, Malaysia through our mean in KL. So. Maybe you have an advice in, on the photography angle? Um, so I'm not sure I understood your question exactly. So basically, you said just now that our culture and our people is not centered in Kuala Lumpur. But let's say we want to do it in, still in Kuala Lumpur. What should we do? Should oh, we I, think it's, I think there's culture in Kuala Lumpur. Don't, um, don't misunderstand me. What I yeah. mean is it's like it gets what I mean is like development has almost kind of hidden away many of the All kind right. of aspects of KL. So you see many of the old buildings being destroyed. Um, and there's a trend now, like if you go to some parts of KL, you will see like some of these places have been um, revamped, you know, yeah. to look, so they look, they, they are, the structures are old, but it becomes maybe a nice fusion restaurant or something along those lines. And so, so, instead of completely destroying the building and building a, a new steel and glass structure, there's now, you start to see more of a trend where they keep the architecture because the architecture has history, but mm -hmm. it's been used to something that's more contemporary today. 
Yeah. And I just feel like maybe, um, you know, the mistakes, if you, it's like when you go to Singapore, Singapore is a very modern city. Uh, city. Yeah. And, but if you look at any of their old architecture, it's almost, um, a lot of it was destroyed, mm -hmm. you know, and, and completely just built up from new. It doesn't feel like the real thing. And so what I'm saying is like the old and new can live next to each other. Um, just don't be in such a hurry to destroy all the old stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. I understand. Maybe we can just um, go to the next questions. Have you done any studio photography? Uh, I don't do much of it, but I do some of it, yes. Okay. Um, yeah. Hold on, let me check questions from our our viewers here um what is your favorite local length of cameras focal length focal sorry 35 mil 35 mil all right and prime or zoom lens uh my favorite is to be just with a prime mm -hmm. but for work sometimes you have to use zoom because you you need to be speed uh, fast but if i'm working on my project and i have time uh, you know, to work on it for as long as I like, then I I would use primes. Do you working any in with any project currently? Uh, just the work that I'm doing on the Yellow River in China. So I'm still mm. working on that, uh, and I go back once a year to to document and and shoot that. So this year I was going to go in April, but it doesn't look like I can travel anymore because of uh, uh, because of what's happening. Yeah, and how long is this project? Uh, I've been shooting it since 2011. Uh, I go back, I go back for a few weeks every year to, to document it. Uh, right. and then, yeah. Very interesting. So no other projects here in Malaysia? Uh, not Your personal project? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I have personal projects every now and again. Uh, but yeah, at the moment, my main focus is the one on the Yellow River. I see. So let us uh, move to MCO. Uh, we see your recent photo featured on NetGeo. How you right. posted something personal to you about family during this MCO? What sparked you to do that? Uh, Matt Geo was asking photographers around the world mm -hmm. to contribute something relating to the family and, uh, and our experiences, uh, photographers' experiences with being uh, quarantined or in self-isolation. Mm -hmm. So I had to find something that could relate to um, what, you know, that could relate to the idea of family. Mm -hmm. uh, so I photographed my wife and myself. I decided yep. to do a portrait. Yep. Uh, the favorite place that we like, we like uh, because uh, we love that view from our apartment. And uh, Matt Gio also asked us to write something about our experiences in these places. So, uh, so that's what I did, you know. Yeah. It's very interesting photos. It's, it's, it's a normal, it's like, like a very simple, but it tells stories. Thank you. Yeah. What do you feel in the importance of family and familial uh, values during this time? Like uh, for you, you have family across the globe. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, in the end, like, uh, you know, I think most of us can agree that, that we kind of think of family in uh, similar ways, you know, that it's love, support, et cetera. At least that's what, if you are, if you are unhappy family relationships, that's yeah. always the case. Like the best of families should really bring out ideas of love, support. Yeah. Um, and I think in a period like this, that we, what we're going through, I kind of feel like this becomes more important uh, but I also like that you see examples also around the world, mm -hmm. of people um, doing things that help the community as well. So people start to group together um, um, to, to kind of help their own communities in whatever way they can. Yeah. Uh, of course, you see that the bad side as well, but I'm, I'd like to think I'm more of an optimist yeah. uh, and so yeah all right 
we have another question about photography here. What is your favorite country to photo photograph and why? Uh, no favorites, but I would say I would say that one country that I went to that really was special to me uh, as an experience was Vietnam. Uh, I went to the north of Vietnam to do a story for National Geographic. All right. And I was looking at uh, cardamom, uh, black cardamom farmers. All right. We would go into the nature reserve, uh, the Hong Lan Shan uh, uh, National Park. All right. Uh, and so we, you had, they would trek into the jungle uh, okay. to harvest the uh, black cardamom. So to get inside there, um, uh, to get to the edge of the forest, you have to ride. They ride scooters, which I joined them on. Uh, right. The roads are so bad and rough uh that is really painful for like two or three hours to get to get there bumpy right there. very very bumpy <laughs> uh and i remember i had to go and camp inside the jungle with uh with the farmers All right. uh, we brought our tents uh with the journalists and um i had to bring enough batteries to last me the whole week which i was going to stay wow. in the jungle wow. uh and then uh, we traveled inside there and we had to hike in there for a few hours to get, mm -hmm. get to our um, destination, which was uh, their plot was by a, river, a small river. Mm -hmm. uh, had these huge trees that were on top and then we would camp there and then they would create their own uh, camping site using available wood that was, you know, dead wood that was in, in the forest. Okay, and on the spot. Yeah, and just build build something to, to stay in for a few days there. All right. Um, and then in the mornings, I would hike out with them to where they would cut the fruit, mm -hmm. uh, with, uh, cardamom, which were like red, red fruit, uh, and right. they're like just they they look almost not that dissimilar to palm, you know, the oil, the palm yeah. oil fruit, mm -hmm. and um, and so they would literally chop all that stuff, leave it on the the ground. And then someone will come along and put it in baskets and then they'll carry it. And I was photographing all of this. And the landscape in that part of uh, Vietnam is beautiful. The people and the food, amazing, you know. Um, so, yeah, it was a, a pretty special experience. Yeah. Where can we see these uh, 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 pictures of, of your project? Of this project? Uh, you, you can see that on my website right now. So if you if you type in uh, ente.com, it will take you straight to that story. And you, of course, it uh, works from the Yellow River as well and all these other uh, projects. Yeah. You say in your Vietnam piece that uh, Sapa is gaining traction. Can you advise us if uh, we like to go to Sapa and see the black cardamom? Um, any think, language barrier issue? Issue? Any ba uh, language barrier issue? Uh, so, I think you can buy black cardamom. I'm not so sure you can actually hike in and follow the farmers in there without uh, actually first getting contact with these guys. But the people who who do these kind of uh, hikes, um, they're also uh, tourist guides, so they can take you into the forests and various places so that you can have an authentic experience there that's not uh, too touristy. So Sapa itself can be quite touristy and yeah. it can be a warning to what like tourism on steroids could look like. Okay. You know, very, very beautiful area, but the, the town itself has got a lot of hotels. It's nice for a few days as a tourist, but uh, it's when you think about it, the whole town the whole center of the town just exists for, for tourists. Um, but outside, you have the rice terraces. You have uh, people who often who go there, they go hiking uh, into the hills, etc. And then you have guides that take you into these places. And uh, it's it's very beautiful. All right. Um, another question is about um, your job. I mean, your, uh, your, your personal um, patience about um, being an advocate of climate change, do you feel like some few who think this is uh, the earth responding to human co commercialize? Uh, say, say that again. Okay, this is a question by Dina. Being an advocate climate change, 
Do you feel like some few who think this is the earth responding to human commercialism? Commercialism. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think my most recent post on my Instagram account, and also it's just been published in that year. Um, uh, it's a picture looking out of my window again, but this time the, the subject's about nature. Uh, and I mentioned something about that. Uh, I can't help but feel that right now, um, uh, what we're experiencing is like the earth or the, the planet trying to reset itself because of our ex excesses, you know, that we've taken so much from this planet uh, we've abused it so much that uh, it needs to find a way to rest and reset. Um, a friend of mine was maybe less, uh, was more direct uh, with what he said. And he just said that um, we are COVID-19 and COVID-19 is the antibodies that's trying to protect the planet. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and I, it's a bold you know, it's funny, but it's, there's a lot of truth in that sometimes, yeah, I think. Yep, 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 yep. Um, another question. I'm a student in photography. How do I go about to go into journalism? Photography, particularly for jobs in Malaysia. So the question was, he, he's, uh, how was do thing. he go about to go into journalism photography? Photojournalism? Yeah, photo. Uh, well, I think... For me, I taught myself, but I learned a lot of what I was doing through looking uh, at photographers uh, who were at the top of their profession. I learned a lot from looking at their, their books. But nowadays, you have many uh, workshops that you can attend. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure this year, Obscura Photo Festival isn't going on anymore, but they're, they're, every August, they used to have workshops uh, every year uh, that... Mm -hmm you uh it was a professional workshop you didn't have to be professional but you're being taught by very well-known photographers um and quite often you could learn photojournalism that way uh, and there's also a festival in uh cambodia that i'm also involved in with as well um and it's called uh, um uh angkor photo festival so he can look they can look that up but i think you have a choice you can go to college and learn that uh but you can also i think go about by taking a lot of private small workshops with other classes and you can learn that in an intense way um and i think that's important to do that um but other than just learning you need to at some point take the time to go do some of that work yourself and try it out and see if you can make it happen. Yeah. Okay, maybe last questions. Um, your advice to all the budding photographers out there. Uh, last words of advice. Ah, yeah. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the biggest one, I think, is perseverance. Uh, I think... It doesn't matter how much talent you have at the beginning. Um, of course, it helps to be talented. But I think over time, if you keep pushing and keep working at what you do, um, and I mean in developing your craft, not about the money side, because mm -hmm. the money side, it requires a different set of skills. But if you concentrate on developing your craft and learning how to do that well, you will eventually get good. Uh, and in order to get that good, you need to have perseverance. You need to keep going out there, turning up for the job, uh, doing your own personal projects, because it's through doing that you really improve. All right. Thank you so much. I've been, I have taken one hour, almost one hour of your time. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you so, so much. All right. Hey guys, uh, that's the end of our session for today. And join us tomorrow night uh, on Ajak Borak session with uh, another interesting figure. We will have um, for uh, Pogeography, our content creator and blogger, Farah Fauzana. 
um, um, t- uh, celebrity brand ambassador and also Casey from Sabah Tourism Board. We were, we were talking about um, influence, influencer or social media, the bad, the good, the bad and the ugly. So stay tuned for tomorrow night. And thank you so much. Uh, if you will, let us know what kind of topics that um, you guys want us to uh, ajak bora on next session. All right. And uh, thank you so much for watching Ajak Bora today. Until then, bye. Bye. All right, thank you so much, Ian. No worries. That's a very interesting sharing. <laughs> Thank you for the interview and Say thanks again? for inviting me. Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Till next time. Bye. Take care. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bye. Bye.